Thank you so much for listening to the Talking Classical podcast. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the Talking Classical podcast and you'll receive a notification every time a new episode is released. You can also follow the Talking Classical podcast on Twitter, on the Talking Classical blog and on Facebook and YouTube. Many thanks for listening once again. I hope that you'll be able to join me for the next episode very soon. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Talking Classical podcast. Of course, this current time presents a wonderful opportunity to listen to lots of music and explore new listening recommendations. One particular project that came my way is the fabulous work of Brana Records. Brana Records is a label dedicated to restoring the wonderful rare recordings by the Polish-Brazilian pianist Felicia Blumenthal. As well as recording well-known masterpieces such as the piano concertos of Grieg and Rachmaninoff, Felicia Blumenthal championed neglected early 19th century piano composers such as Clementi, Kulau and Czerny, as well as solo piano music by Spanish and Portuguese Baroque composers. She enjoyed a relationship with leading composers such as Penderecki and Villa-Lobos. His fifth piano concerto was dedicated to Miss Blumenthal, which she performed under the composer's baton with the leading orchestras of Europe and recorded for EMI in Paris with the Orchestre Nationale. Her appearances in South and North America brought her further acclaim. Many of these wonderful rare recordings are now released on Brana Records and all CD covers feature the beautiful artwork of Felicia Blumenthal's husband. I was delighted to receive one of these recordings in the post. Her shimmering piano playing and her beautiful artistry shines through and I'll definitely be exploring many more of these recordings. If you'd like to find out more about the work of Brana Records and how you can support this wonderful project, then please go to branarecords.com where you can find out more about the recordings and purchase them. Another wonderful album that I would definitely recommend listening to is the debut album of Mike Ladiser. Mike Ladiser is an award-winning American composer known for working on blockbuster movies such as Ad Astra and Mission Impossible Fallout, as well as the BBC hit TV series His Dark Materials. On the 17th of April, Mike's debut album Between Worlds was released, featuring 42 of London's top musicians. The music was recorded at Angel Studios and is published by Warp Publishing. This album was designed as a multi-art form immersive experience featuring bespoke videos and album artwork. Each video presents space scenes from NASA's satellite photography and stunning landscapes taken on Earth from drone footage filmed by Philip Whiteman. The album artwork has been created by Nick Denman using the automatic drawing process. It's a series of paintings with acrylic and charcoal on canvas. Mike also teaches at London's Royal College of Music and the University of Cambridge, where he teaches the film music curriculum at both undergraduate and master's levels. I talked to Mike last week via Zoom, and we discussed some of the ways that online teaching can benefit music students during this current time, and how digital technologies can also benefit composers during this period. In particular, Mike has a Twitch channel, which is very, very relevant for the kind of work that he does. We also discussed the importance of narrative and individuality within a composer's voice, something that's very much at the heart of Between Worlds. We also talked about the creative process behind the album and the collaboration between other narrative media. Mike is very keen to expand this album into other art forms such as ballet. Many thanks to Jonathan Tester for putting me in touch with Mike and making me aware of Mike's wonderful work. And many thanks to Mike for taking the time out of his very busy schedule to talk to me. So how is isolation treating you? Yeah, it's been, um, you know, it's actually been a sort of fortunate kind of time period. Um, in yeah. that, you know, things have, I think, sort of... Um, it was, I guess just that it was the right time in that I was planning on releasing my album around this time anyway. My initial plan was to go out to LA yeah. and to kind of do a physical launch out there. Um, but it sort of worked to my advantage to focus just on the digital release um, and kind of take advantage of the fact that people are home and looking for entertainment. Um, so I think the um, launch has actually been quite successful and, you know, it allowed me the time to just dig into that completely. 
Um, and it was also, you know, sort of just fortunate with a couple other projects and things that had wrapped up uh, right before this lockdown. So in, in that regard, too, it just allowed me to clear the deck and um, put things into perspective. It must be really nice for you, actually, with the sort of work that you do, that you're able to um, actually work and create and come up with new ideas. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I think it's also given the the time, you know, I think a lot of people have talked about finding a positive spin on it and that sort yes. of thing. Um, you know, I think for me, that has really been, um, it was the right time for me to anyway, kind of reassess, like, what is my next move? Um, and along with the timing, I have uh, just signed a, a publishing deal with Warp Publishing. Um, and that was sort of something that was in the works for quite a while and the fact that it kind of happened all right at the same time as the release um it's just kind of felt right and it now gives me means to be able to sort of take a step back focus on okay where where am i moving forward to next rather than uh previously i think i was in more of a position where you kind of have to take certain work and you know just kind of chug along and uh take particular gigs but um, so with that time, I've been able to kind of assess and figure out, okay, these are sort of my next moves. And how, how's the teaching as well going? Because I know that term has officially started. Um, so it must be quite a different way of working for you and the other students as well. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I think most of it has moved to digital. Maybe there's not too much of a difference because um most of the work that they have to submit is coursework based so yeah for for my students um not to kind of you know bore with details of uh <laughs> the, the specifics of what things have to shift um in general it's it's kind of moved to more um online teaching which mm -hmm. um in some cases i'd already been doing um and i think it's sort of opened up new ways of uh approaching you know this where what i found is sort of delivering lectures remotely actually has some some advantages rather than to do it in person where i don't feel i miss the interaction actually in some ways it's better because you can record it and you can also have a sort of group chat going things which can all then be archived Mm -hmm. um, so and i can also more easily share my screen and operating out of my own studio then i'm able to use my full equipment and uh you know to sort of share sessions of things that i'm working on um i think it's sort of opened up a lot of ways of how we could kind of go forward um and you know some advantages to doing this we're thinking how can we actually bring these tools into the classroom to do it in person um, and I think specifically, you know, with sort of recording lectures and classes in such a kind of complete way where, you know, previous to this, it was mostly someone putting up a kind of voice recorder to just record, you know, what you're saying in class. Um, but now you can have a sort of full transcript of a chat and video and all of these things. So I think in those ways, you know, it's, it's made things better. Um, there's also been some challenges, you know, with realizing kind of who has access to certain physical equipment and that kind of thing mm. that shifts. So there's some challenges, but I think again, it forces us to think towards, okay, what sort of, you know, maybe remote solutions can we come up with for the future? Um, you know, such as sort of making workstations remote accessible. Um, and I think it's even in sort of meetings and that sort of thing, having uh, Zoom meetings or Windows team meetings that sort of thing is is kind of easier for everybody and is a more efficient way of doing things. So yeah, I think you know, in it's not all bad, um, but that's I think specific to uh, working with sort of composition for screen. Um, there's a lot of tools and tech that's kind of emerging out of this, um, and you know, sort of developing a bit further because of this. Um, so I, I feel quite positive about it. I think it's sort of only going to enhance the teaching experience. Um, and it's made me think of ways in which I could be a teacher sort of beyond a couple universities specifically in these classrooms. 
um, and how I can kind of open up my educational resources to more people. Mm. I, I did a little bit of teaching myself um, and maybe with the online teaching with the current situation at the moment, maybe your students are more receptive to sharing their ideas and to participating, maybe compared to if they were in a classroom altogether. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's sort of offering, you know, different tools and timelines is also another thing that when I found this um, sort of a, a year or two ago with um, some of my students that it's also when you set a weekly schedule and say, okay, we, we're going to meet on Friday at this time, there's a million things that might be going on in their life and with other classes and assignments and inevitably, you know, they show up and maybe sometimes they're a bit less prepared than they had hoped. Mm -hmm. And for you to reschedule a physical meeting, especially if with Cambridge, for instance, if I'm going to take the day and travel there, it's quite a commitment and mm -hmm. where it opens up these tools where, okay, it's one much easier to reschedule if we're both sort of sitting at home. Um, but two, if we can then, you know, um, if I'm going to give a lecture and that's going to be recorded, they know they can access that later, um, you know, it makes it easier where, okay, I had something come up right now. I can't quite make it to the virtual class, but I know I'm not going to miss out on those tools. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think there's sort of new ways of approaching this. Um, and I, and the sort of expanding the, the sort of educational tools, um, it's made me sort of realize that maybe there's a new opportunity um, in reaching out um, and providing it to more than just that. Um, and one thing that I've been thinking of recently and, and kind of deep diving into is starting a Twitch channel. Oh, yes. Um, I know. Are you very familiar with Twitch? I'm I sure am. Yeah, familiar. yeah. It's great, isn't it? For your area of um, expertise with all the filming and gaming resources on Twitch. So. Yeah, I, I really see it as it's sort of a, a brilliant resource where, you know, for what I want, was thinking of doing anyway with this is starting to record more kind of tutorials and lectures mm -hmm. and provide that as a sort of, um, you know, set of, here's a starting point of things. Everybody go watch my YouTube playlist and then show up in the first class, you know, kind of ready to go. Mm -hmm. Rather than me giving the same talk to 40 people at the beginning of every year. And then I thought actually with Twitch, that kind of allows me a more interactive experience and you can kind of do, you can dive deeper because you can do it more often. Um, and it also affords what I plan on doing with the channel is allowing people maybe setting um, assignments or sort of challenges that can then hear something to review, submit your work, we'll review it next week. And um, things that I might be doing in a classroom anyway, but then opening that up to many more people beyond sort of the, the set institutions I'm with already. Mm. Uh, so I find that very exciting. And I think it's, it's just another tool as a musician to be able to kind of expand and to allow me to do what I'm doing in a much broader way and have a, a bigger outreach. What do you try to instill in your students when you are teaching composition? Um, well, I think for, a, because it's mostly um, composition for screen, I think, you know, one of the main things that I try to get across is uh, talking about narrative. Because there are, of course, we have composition lessons where we're talking about actual technique and craft and orchestration and all that. Um, but it's really that those are then tools for you to be a storyteller. And so understanding narrative is really the most important thing of composing for any kind of media, um, because that's what then allows you to figure out what point of view am I writing the music from, uh, you know, from whose perspective, what's the feeling I'm trying to achieve with the audience. Then you can rely on that craft in order to get that across. It's really uh, comes back to narrative. You know, and those are sort of the main things that we go over, which I think you learn from all sorts of narrative media, you know, and I, I encourage my students also, it's, you shouldn't just be studying film music. 
you should be studying just film, reading books, go see a ballet, watch an opera. You should be learning from all types of narrative media. Definitely. And and that, that idea of narrative definitely is something that comes across in your new album, Between Worlds. So how did that come about and what was your narrative? Between Worlds was a sort of, um, well, this project has been, if I, if I think about the initial ideas, you know, before it really was the album, um, it's been going on for maybe a year and a half or two years or so. Um, and uh, at this point, maybe even longer. But yeah, I, I really just decided I want to do an album of, of music that I like, of music that I really feel represents my compositional voice. Um, and, you know, ultimately the music I want to be hired to write. And um, so I, I thought of the album as a chance to do that where on, in film projects, you know, you don't, um, it's, it's not your music at the end of the day. You know, it is music that supports that project and it's not the same um, as doing something on your own, like writing a symphony or putting out an album. And it's not better or worse. It's just the nature of whenever you collaborate with someone, you're relinquishing control. And that's also the beauty of it. But so this album, for me, was really a chance to kind of explore that. Um, and the narrative for me, but I came up with just a sort of loose story um, that's somewhat based around kind of space exploration and, mm -hmm. and humanity. Um, and I really just used it as a jumping point where I could um, lay out essentially story beats of what that narrative was, and then think of each of these tracks as a, a piece of that story, you know, or a, a beat or a scene of that story. Um, and then I kind of used that as a brief to start writing the tracks to. Um, so that's sort of the whole concept of the album. And what I feel makes it sort of uh, cohesive from start to finish is that it does follow this narrative thread um, that's really, you know, about sort of this one person who is uh, going off to, you know, try to explore other uh, worlds and possibilities, you know, for a kind of dying humanity and then um, finds themselves sort of completely alone and has to kind of evolve. Um, that's the sort of loose narrative. And then, you know, as it develops, it became, uh, when writing it, it was really a chance for me to express a lot of my own sort of personal feelings and um, through different things that I've experienced and, and been through. Um, so there's different tracks on there. Some are very personal to me. Some are maybe a bit more something that I just liked and wanted to create. Um, and, you know, but each of those sort of falls in line with that story. And um, I'm really happy with how it's sort of come out and that I, I feel I could express myself through it. Is there a particular track on the album that you're most proud of or that resonates with you most? Um, it's, it's hard to say. I imagine it's like, I don't have kids, but I imagine it's like you can't pick your favorite kid, you know, <laughs> and... In a way, I think it, it's that all the tracks, they, they mean a lot to me for a lot of different reasons. Um, there's particular moments, you know, I think that I'm, I'm very proud of or that I feel really sort of stick out to me. Um, one thing I'll, I guess is I love the, uh, with the track Greetings, which I chose to be the sort of first single off the album um, and using the uh, voices from the NASA Voyager missions, um, all the, the speech for that, all the different greetings that were, were sent on the Voyager missions on the golden record. And I, you know, just loved how that kind of came together. It was just a sort of uh, rough idea to try and put them together. And then I sort of, you know, didn't realize until it all came together in the end and sort of the flow of the speech and uh, how it worked with the music. I, I was just really happy with um, how that came out. And, and then I think there's a few tracks that I've, I've sort of, you know, said publicly, like the fifth track, Dear Leah, is a very personal track to me. Um, so is maybe Farewell is quite a personal track. Um, 
but I don't think they uh, sort of preclude some of the other ones that are, I also feel really sort of proud of for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And and I also wanted to ask you about the um, the artwork that goes along with the tracks, because I found it very interesting that the video installations um, seem to be very different from the way that the art you commissioned that was a very different interpretation of your music. So why did you want to collaborate with an artist and how important is collaborating with different media for you? Um, well, so the the artwork came about from uh, Nick Denman is the artist and Nick is a, a dear, dear friend of mine that I've known for most of my life. Uh, Nick and I went to high school together and um, Nick is a trained musician, um, has a degree in music as well as a degree in visual art. Nick had done, um, before I had moved to London, he had done a series of sort of visualizing music and, and sort of drawing these passions together for him. And he had given me a piece where he had kind of essentially analyzed a, a song and had um, visualized it through different layers of acrylic paint. And so that, you know, these kind of combined and mixed together in different places. Mm. You know, I wanted Nick to, I wanted to collaborate with him on the artwork and said, you know, I love this concept, but obviously I don't want the same thing. I want to give you free reign. So, you know, Nick had said, you know, initially he's like, I really struggled with this because I wasn't sure um, where to begin. I had provided him with demos and with full scores and everything, you know, kind of laid out to give him as much material uh, to work with. And he was like, you know, it's so complete. The, the orchestration and all that is so detailed already. I didn't really know where to fit in. And then he thought, you know, why don't I do the opposite? And he um, tried this concept of automatic drawing, um, which is where the artist sort of goes into a meditative state and draws very freely. Um, and, you know, as he says, he comes up with sort of these scribbles. And um, so for Nick, he decided then to, I mean, one, he would do these first on specific moments of the album. Um, and there were certain tracks and parts that I had pointed out to him, like this part means a lot to me or, you know, and um, so he would do that. And then it, he did about 20 of these, um, which I've got the artwork sort of all over my room here. He's oh, given wow. me all the originals. Um, but he did so many of them um, and it eventually evolved into him kind of listening through the whole album and sort of jumping in and coming out whenever he felt was right. Mm. Um, so it was initially about, you know, this track, and then it became, okay, this is my interpretation of the album on this run. Um, so once he had these sort of scribbles in place, Nick would, uh, he described it like kind of looking at clouds or tea leaves where you sort of images would kind of jump out at you or different figures. So he decided to color those in and where we started was initially with these very sort of broad colors of fe or fields of color. And then we would try different things sort of going back and forth. And I would say, this really, you know, sticks out to me. And I, I really love how, how that's working on the page visually. Um, and we tried a couple other things like, you know, what if we did different materials like charcoal versus acrylic paint or different thickness of the line um, different gradations with the color and ultimately we kind of came back to just these very broad fields of color um, you know that was very sort of striking um, and it sort of came out that the three uh, that I had chosen for the final to be on the vinyl um, which are the three that I used as a sort of cover art for the first three singles they all kind of had a line that was going off the page mm -hmm. or sort of going somewhere else um, and you know just sort of stuck out that they were they had a lot more sort of motion to them um, yeah so it was really natural collaboration um, and I think that sort of speaks to the whole project which is you know what I kind of imagined from the beginning is that this album could be one piece of art on its own but then allow others to create their art on top of it Mm. where Nick has been able to kind of create his own whole series of paintings out of this 
Um, I also worked with the um, my friend Philip Whiteman, who captured all this amazing drone footage. Yes, and, um, it's just spectacular. Right. It, it is. It's it's amazing. You know, it's just he's had this archive of all this footage, you know, from all over the world. And it fits so well with all the images from NASA. And, you know, where I was just trying to follow somewhat based on the artwork Nick created, where it was, you know, there was a lot of like lines and shapes in the um, shots that I, I chose. Um, and kind of how I was trying to edit together sort of from certain lines to another. Um, and then, you know, Philip has now been working on some amazing shots of abandoned London and uh, is been piecing together a, a new version of a music video from one of the tracks uh, mm -hmm. that we're hoping to release soon. I find that really exciting for other people to then take the music and expand onto it. Um, and I'd love to also take that into the dance space and um, start to create kind of a, a version of music videos with dancers, you know, and different choreography that kind of goes throughout. Um, so, you know, ultimately we may have, you know, the album on its own, the album with the artwork, the visual uh, version of the album with the drone footage, and then maybe a sort of episodic ballet version of the album. Um, so I, I would love to just see kind of what can come out of this whole project. Yes, yes, definitely. So you, you just talked about how creators um, would find their own interpretation of this album. What would you like the listeners to get out of listening then? What I love is, is for the people uh, who listen to it to kind of have their own interpretation. And I hope that it allows for a sort of space for people to, you know, be able to kind of um, reflect and, and meditate on themselves. Um, so the I did a launch event in August for the album, um, and I did it at the at the hospital club in um, Covent Garden. Mm -hmm. And we for that event we had all the original artwork. Nick came over and we set it up as an art exhibition, and I had these um, silent disco headphones where it was streaming the album continuously. So you could walk into the exhibition and you were kind of entering at whatever point the album was at. Um, and we had cool lighting and all the artwork all over the place and some plants and glowing orbs and all of these made it a really sort of um, ambient atmosphere. And I had the immersive visuals projected on the wall. Um, and what I found, you know, is people sort of felt like they could go in and it was sort of stepping out of the noise of the city, you know, or other things that were going on in their life, and that it was a chance for them to really just kind of be with themselves. And that's really my hope with the music is that in a way it, you know, not to think too grand about it, but that it, if it could be sort of healing in a way, if it allows someone to sort of you know, reflect on themselves and kind of go into their own space and uh, find some calm, then that's sort of my goal and my aim with it. You're um, teaching at the University of Cambridge and you also teach at the Royal College of Music. So what advice would you give to any young aspiring composers looking to go into um, the film and television industry? Yeah, I think the main thing, you know, is um, is writing. You know, the, the main thing is your craft. And it's the one thing that you can do all the time, that you're completely in control of. I'd say a couple things that I've learned over, over the past few years or so especially is you're really only in control of two things. You're, you control the work that you do, and you control your ability to say yes or no to doing it. And, you know, you have no control over what people think of you, what they think of your music, how it's received and kind of how it goes out into the world. Um, so I think focusing on the craft is always, you know, kind of key. That's, you, you've got to be um, experienced. You've got to be ready to do a great job and it's competitive. Um, and I think that applies to um, whether it's film or just music in general. 
Um, and then I think really follow what you want to do um, because there's, you know, uh, what's the sort of famous saying, be yourself because everybody else is already taken. <laughs> you know, it's, th there's so many people who try to sound like what they think is in trend. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, it's just not going to work. It, and I think especially now, what is in trend is being unique. Is, um, you know, if you look at sort of um, some of the more inventive scores that have come out in the past few years, it's people who have a really unique voice. You know, something like um, Hilder's score for Chernobyl, you know, is an incredibly unique approach to doing something. Um, and I think that that's what people are really interested in rather than there's maybe a pendulum that swings back and forth between wanting, you know, sort of the it thing and then being sick of the it thing and wanting something that's completely new that nobody's ever heard of. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, eventually they'll get sick of that too and they want the, the one thing that's on brand. Mm -hmm. um, but I think now is a really good time to be unique and for creators to just be honest about what their own voice is. Um, and so I think that means if, you know, you have, uh, if you're, I find with some of my students too, it's maybe, you know, I'm pulled in a bunch of different directions that, you know, I really like big orchestral film music like John Williams or John Powell or, you know, but I also love drum and bass and, you know, I, I love uh, house music and great. Then, you know, live in all of those spaces and create the thing that is really unique to you don't try to just kind of fit into or feel like you need to pigeonhole yourself into being, you know, something that people expect you to be. That That's so interesting. And that's really great advice because I think that maybe the composition industry, maybe classical composition has changed a lot over, even over the space of maybe five to 10 years or so. And I think maybe there was in the past a pressure to, compose in a certain way or to compose certain kind of pieces but now maybe it's become more more democratic and also I was talking to a composer and he was saying that actually now people are judged on the basis of their character and that character forms the basis for their compositions what's your opinion on on that I guess, I mean, you mean on, uh, you know, sort of being that your uh, sort of compositional voice is based on your character? Um, well, I mean, what you were just saying about having that individuality in your composition. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I think, you know, it's really, that's, that's what interests me. Um, but I think it's what interests a lot of people. I think also in, in ways that you can kind of connect to someone. You know, and um, I think it is a lot more democratic now, as you say, between, um, you know, sort of the line is blurred between what is sort of classical, what's pop, you know, what is, wh what occupies either of these spaces. Um, because you see more uh, what may have been considered previously as like a crossover artist that's now, you know, they are just who they are, like, Anna Meredith or Mika Levy or mm. someone like that, who they just have a, a awesome voice, you know, and their music is great and it's incredibly inventive and unique to them. And, uh, you know, it's, we don't need to fit people into this box of like, well, they, you know, did an orchestral commission and they have a cool rock band, you know, they can sort of be one in the same, they can just be an artist. Um, and I, I think that's also something that's really exciting is rather than having to kind of live in these different worlds, you know, you can kind of just make it work around the thing that you do. Well, I think that's a really nice way of coming full circle and nice way to finish. So thank you so much, Mike. It was really nice to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. This is lovely.